Hello, welcome to Philosophy Roulette number 197, where I read and review philosophy live on air. I just did a paper a minute or two ago on my Becoming to Lose in Vedanta on Attributes, A Cosmism and Parallelism in Spinoza. So if you're on YouTube, that'll be in, it'll probably be just uploaded before this one. But now I had found, run into a um, paper from Analysis from forthcoming and so an argument against causal decision theory and since i have it ready to go and i have a little bit more time right now i'm gonna pull it up so make my life easier just do the paper i have so let's see where is that let me get the And for those in, yep. For those in chat, here's the link to the uh, page. And you can always type um, exclamation point uh, paper and the link will pop back up uh, if you come later. And it's not like right there. And you can just download it right here since it is available on Phil Papers. Oh, you can't see that, but like, see. It's right there, so if you come back to the link, it will be available. Okay, so an argument against causal decision theory. So are we using causal decision theory to say you shouldn't use causal decision theory? I wonder how they're going to argue that. All right. Introduction. Critics of causal decision theory, CDT, have put forward various alleg alleged counterexamples, in cases in which they claim rationality and the recommendations of causal decision theory, CDT, diverge. For the most part, proponents of CDT have been unconvinced, viewing the intuition the alleged counterexamples elicit with a mixture of suspicion and opposition. So proponents, I, I think I've said opponents. The dispute is thus at an impasse, and one worries that unless there is some way to move beyond judgments about cases, the dispute will devolve into an unproductive clash of intuitions. My goal in this paper is to move beyond the impasse. I criticize uh, causal decision theory, um, not by appeal to judgments about cases, but by explicit argument. I formulate a principle of preference, which I call the guaranteed principle. I argue that the preferences of rational agents satisfy the guaranteed principle that the preferences of agents who embody CDT do not, and hence CDT is false. So basically, rational people satisfy this principle, but the preferences of people who do causal decision theory do not satisfy the guaranteed principle, what we're supposed to really, 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 really like guaranteed principle, and so hence we're going to reject CDT. The question is, of course, how much am I really going to like this principle? Do I like it less or more than CDT? And then it's just back to a question of intuitions. We shall see. Say that a decision guarantees money N if the, if the agent knows that some particular option made available by the decision would yield N dollars if chosen. And say that a decision forces N dollars if the agent knows that every option made available by the decision would yield N dollars if chosen. Yeah, I know it's a, a variable probably, but actually I'm not so sure it's a variable. It's likely a variable if you're a computer scientist. These people might be computer scientists, but I don't know here. So this might guarantee N or N dollars, but this is causal decision theory. So you have to, um, I don't know exactly yet. We'll see what, what happens. If we assume that agents satisfy certain simplifying assumptions, care only about money and value dollars linearly, then we can formulate the guarantee principle as follows. Yeah, see, I, I, I I know how these people, uh, I've, I've read some of this stuff. A lot of times everything is dollars to them, which is one of the weird things about it. There are things that are not dollars, but many times it is just dollars. <laughs> Guaranteed principle. A rational agent always strictly prefers decision that guarantees N dollars to a decision that forces uh, M dollars less than N dollars. So a rational agent always strictly prefers decision that guarantees the more money. No, yeah, I mean, it, this is just, if for anyone who works with variables, they should have, that's your first reaction. It was mine too, but I, no, my first reaction is philosophy. My second reaction was the computer thing, but that's because, that's just me. 
But yeah, the motivation for the guaranteed principle is straightforward. A rational agent never strictly prefers fewer options. Um, never strictly. Okay, as far as strictly goes, you might prefer fewer options, but given the option to have more, you probably should take it because if it, they're all better. All right, if D1 is a decision that forces money in and D2 is just like D1, except that it makes additional options available, then a rational agent agent weakly prefers d2 to d1 and a rational agent strictly prefers d1 to some decision d0 which forces less money than n so by transitivity we get the guaranteed principle all right i mean we'll have to keep going this does seem to be like the setup here seems reasonable but i mean I, i'm already getting like the spider sense of like we've got uh, we've got a less than here we've got a weekly prefers we've got strictly um like strictly prefers and then like turns to weekly so there's a lot of like little concepts that built that are getting built in here and uh this uh makes my spidey sense be like i don't have to i'm a little worried now the guaranteed principle does not hold of imperfect agents well there we go what human is not is a perfect agent? All right, nor of agents who expect to be imperfect. Take, let's take an extreme example. Suppose that the least choice worthy option made available by a decision that guarantees and money is very bad indeed. And suppose that I have a lesion that makes me choose from among the least choice worthy options when I face decisions of that sort. Then as a way of protecting myself from my disposition, I to choose irrationally, I should prefer the decision that forces M dollars to the decision that guarantees N greater than M dollars. Um, so to protect yourself from your disposition to choose irrationally, you choose the lesser of the monies because N is very bad indeed. Why is N so bad? I don't know. But the guaranteed principle does not purport to hold true of imperfect agents. It's, restric it's restricted to perfectly rational agents, the idealized agents that are su the subject matter of decision theory. If an agent fully expects to choose from among the most choice-worthy options, as rational agents always do, then the agent must strictly prefer a decision that guarantees n money to a decision that forces uh, le m less than n money. All right. And the likelihood counterexample to CDT. I'm going to use the guaranteed principle to argue that a particular alleged counterexample to CDT succeeds. The example I will focus on is the following one from Spencer and Wells 2019. The frustrator. The frustrator. There is an envelope and two opaque boxes A and B. The agent has three options. She can take A, B, or the envelope. The envelope contains 40 bucks. The two boxes together contain 100. How the money is distributed between the boxes depends on a prediction made yesterday by the frustrator, a reliable predictor who seeks to frustrate. If the frustrator predicted that the agent would take A, then, then B contains the 100. If the frustrator predicts that the agent would take B, then A contains 100. If the frustrator predicted that the agent would take the envelope, each box contains 50. The agent knows all of this. There is a strong intuition that rationality requires taking the envelope. CDT, however, does not recommend the envelope. All right, let me just, um, using your own rules to make the rules sounds fair. This is part of the uh, issue in this whole literature is that that's exactly everything they're doing. These sort of things drive me nuts. Um, the frustrator, though, sort of things. They are a reliable predictor who seeks to frustrate her they always predict correctly how do people predict correctly it's not possible that doesn't exist in the real world and a rational agent does not even if someone is perfectly rational the frustrator does not need to exist in a world with perfectly rational people because this is not a rational thing it's magic so that always drives me a little crazy i mean it's nothing really against this author this is a common sort of tactic in this area but like this these things just don't compute in my head and as soon as i see them i'm just like yeah don't doesn't bother me according to causal decision theory an agent should always choose so as to maximize you let w equal w1 through wn be the set of possible worlds let c be the agent's credence function and let u be the agent's utility function we then define the v value of any proposition p uh the value of p is the summation of all the stuff based on all the uh 
outcomes, I guess. All the worlds are based on the outcomes. Note that V obeys the rule of averaging. If Z is a set of propositions that C partitions P in other words, if the exact if exactly one member of Z is true at every P world to which C assigns a non-zero probability, formula, formula, formulas, then the set of dependencies hypotheses or de Dependency hypothesis is a maximally specific proposition about how things the agent cares about do and do not depend causally do not depend causally on their present choice. The value then is this formula. The agent facing the frustrator knows that the envelope contains 40 bucks, so equating dollars in unit value, then the value is 40. The agent does not know how the money is reputed between the boxes, but knows that the box together contains 100. Therefore, no matter how the agent divides her credence, it's always 100. Yep, this is what philosophers do with their diagrams. They add, they put formulas down. Those are our diagrams. Two numbers smaller than 40 cannot sum to 100. So no matter how the agent divides her credence, A and or B, box A, box B, maximize U. Some find the intuitive elicited by the frustrator sufficiently compelling. They need no further argument. The case itself convinces them to re reject causal decision theory. Well, I want to also say this uh, averaging function, the fact that you're averaging the stuff. Why should you average stuff? Why is this the right formula? Like, note that V obeys the rule of averaging. Why does V obey the rule of averaging? Who said that averaging thing is the right way to do anything in this world? I mean, sometimes it's right, but averaging does not necessarily apply here maybe it should maybe it shouldn't but uh you need an argument for that and so if you're not going to average stuff then maybe these numbers aren't going to come out the same okay but i know both from the literature and from personal experience that some remain unconvinced so it's worth trying to undergird the intuition with argument <coughs> say that an agent embodies a decision theory just if the agent knows that she always chooses an option recommended by the decision theory. An agent who embodies, embodies causal decision theory knows that she always chooses a U-maximizing option. I'm going to argue that rational agents do not embody causal decision theory. To get the argument going, consider the following elaboration of the frustrator. Two rooms. An agent must enter either room 1 or room 2. If she enters room 1, she gets $35. If she enters room 2, she faces the frustrator. The agent knows all of this. So this is like a really, really bad Monty Hall. The decision in room number one forces $35. The decision in room two, namely the frustrator, guarantees 40. The guaranteed principle thus entails that a rational agent strictly prefers room two to room one. Yeah, but this one also wastes your time. You have to deal with a frustrating person. If causal decision theory is true, then a rational agent embodies causal decision theory. So we have the first premise of the argument, which is a claim of material implication. If CDT is true, then an agent who embodies CDT strictly prefers room 2 to room 1. The second premise is a claim about the pairwise preferences of an agent who embodies CDT. An agent who embodies CDT strictly prefers room 1 to room 2. To see that P2 is true, we need to run through some calculations. I can go in room 1 twice before I can get out of room 2 once. Yep. Okay. Let A1 and A2 be the options of entering room 1 and room 2, respectively. There are three relevant dependency hypotheses. Either A contains 100, B contains 100, or, or each box contains 50. We know that U A is equal to 35 since room 1 forces 35. What U A 2, what the U of A2 is depends on how the agent divides her credence. All right, so that's a uh, different ways to break up uh, A, B, and the envelope. Let A, B, and envelope be the options available in room two, and let's assume that each entails A2. So that means because you've got 40 or 50 and 50, so you're dividing by two. Again, how, why is a person dividing by two? <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks for stopping by, I'm gnarly, yeah. This is the problem with the reading philosophy is you get too many formulas sometimes. Should have known better, but I didn't, so I just jumped into it. The agent is certain that she will choose, and I'm not, I should just say, it's just bad for reading. It's not bad for philosophy. It's good for philosophy. It's bad for reading on, uh, live on Twitch. <laughs> the agent is certain that she will choose A or B if she enters room two. So A, B, C partitions the following proposition, uh, just the, uh, different possibilities, both of those, if you choose box A or box B, equals 100. 
Cheers. Thanks for stopping by. Since the agent gets 100 bucks if A or B, both A or B is um, the value of A or B is equal to zero since you get zero if A or B. Because you could also get um, could all, equal to zero if you get the wrong box. And both um, VA and VB envelope um, is equal to 50 since the agent gets 50 if, one of, if it's one or the other. Therefore, okay, formula, 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 formula. What these credences and conditional credences are depend depend on on how reliable the agent takes the frustrator to be. In a more realistic case, the agent might take the frustrator to be rather, but not extraordinarily, reliable. But let's suppose to make things simple that the agent takes the frustrator to be almost perfectly reliable. In that case, the agent is virtually certain that some box contains 100 and virtually certain that she will take a box that contains zero if she enters room two. In other words, like you're gonna get zero because the frustrator is always going to pick, have it set up to pick the thing that you didn't pick. It therefore follows that you're gonna get to zero. You're gonna get nothing if you're in the room with the frustrator. If there were diachronic conjunctive long arm options, then we might be able to reconcile CDT with the guarantee principle. An agent facing two rooms would have four diachronic options, uh, room one, A, B, and E. If we assign each of these a U value, the one that maximizes U, R, A, and or B since U A1 equal 35, 40, and then these two is 100. It is not completely clear what preferences among decisions are if there are diachronic options, but if we think of decisions as containing only synchronic options, and we think of a diachronic options as having synchronic options as parts, then we could say that an agent strictly prefers decision I to decision J, just if some synchronic option in DI is part of a some diachronic option that is strictly preferred to every diachronic option that has any synchronic option in DJ as a part. Okay, so basically, just go with the synchronic, just not diachronic, straightforward sort of decision making. An agent who bodies CDC strictly prefers D a uh, box A or B to a room one. So if there were diachronic options, an agent who embodies CDT would in this sense strictly prefer room two to room one, and the conflict between CDT and the guaranteed principle would be removed. But unfortunately for CDT, there aren't any such things. Any agent deciding being, uh, between room one and room two faces a straight choice between two real synchronic options. If the agent embodies CDT, the agent will choose room number one since um, one is greater than two, therefore P2 is true. The two premises of the argument entail the falsity of CDT. I have argued that both premises are true, so I think that we have here a sound argument against causal decision theory. It's not hard to see where CDT goes wrong. It's not irrational for an agent to embody CDT to strictly prefer room one to room two. That's not where the mistake lies. After all, agents who embody CDT almost always get zero upon facing the frustrator, and 35 is better than zero. The mistake lies in embodying CDT and specifically in being disposed to choose so as to maximize you upon facing the frustrator. An agent knows who knows that she will choose as so as to maximize you upon facing the frustrator, knows that she has a strong disposition to choose an empty box and is rational for her to protect herself from this choice-making disposition by violating the guaranteed principle and strictly preferring room one to room two. But a rational agent, unlike an agent who embodies CDT, never needs to protect herself from her own choice-making dispositions. A rational agent facing two rooms fully expects to take the envelope upon entering room two, and therefore satisfies the guarantee principle strictly preferring room two to room one. This again runs afoul, for me at least, with the frustrator, because it seems like the frustrator is doing something that is not embodied in the... Uh, decision theory here as like you're getting there's like knowledge that you could somehow have that of the frustrator and what they're doing that is not being properly accounted for and maybe that's kind of what's going to happen in the diachronic explanation here and just going on but again it's like you're choosing these uh formulas how you want to do this and i don't see like uh it's kind of like a monty hall where you have to know what that Monty is doing something behind the scenes and that's why you change your opinion. Well, I changed my opinion because I know the frustrator is always choosing the, the box that I don't, um, that doesn't have, uh, the prize behind it. 
And so since you know the frustrator knows this, then you know what the frustrator is doing. And so it seems like the terms of the argument are a little funky here. I'm not really choosing room one or room two. It's I'm choosing to deal with the frustrator or not. And that's where the decision is. And so I feel like the way that this is set up is sort of a, a misdirection. But, uh, so, but I don't know enough really about causal decision theory. It just feels like not you're not getting all the information here like there's a certain kind of information that is being um like this is the like you're limited to this information over here but i want to talk about this information over here with the frustrator in it and that seems very relevant to it and you don't even have to do it diachronically diachronic exploitation Cases like two rooms reveal that the preferences of agents who embody CDT violate the guaranteed principle. Such cases also reveal that agents who embody the CDT are diachronically exploitable. But though I think the falsity of CDT follows from its conflict with the guaranteed principle, I do not think the falsity of CDT follows from the diachronic exploitability of agents who embody CDT. Say that a sequence of options made available by a sequence of decisions ensures and money if the agent knows that if she took the sequence, that is, chose each option in the sequence, she would get and money. And say that an agent facing a sequence of decisions is diachronically exploited just if one, there is a sequence of options available to the agent that ensures and money, and the agent takes a sequence that ensures m money, which is less than n money. In two rooms, the sequence of entering room two and taking the envelopes ensures $40. But an agent who embodies CDT takes the sequence of entering room one, which ensures $35. So as past critics of CDT have pointed out, agents who embody CDT are diachronically exploitable. But there are cases that convince me that diachronic exploitability and perfect rationality are compatible. One example is the following. Ahmed's insurance. There is a transparent box and an opaque box. The agent has two options. She can either take the opaque box or both boxes. The transparent box contains 10 bucks. But <coughs> what the opaque box contains depends on a prediction made yesterday by a reliable predictor. I hate these things. Where, who is a reliable predictor? I hate that. Ugh, sorry. If the predictor predicted that the agent would take the both boxes, the opaque box contains negative 50 a debt the agent must repay if the predictor predicted that the agent would take only the opaque box the opaque box contains 50 bucks at the second stage therefore looking into the opaque box the agent faces a second decision she can either bet 75 at 1 to 3 that the predictor predicted correctly or bet 25 at 3 to 1 that the predictor predicted incorrectly the agent knows all of this from the outset there are two relevant dependency hypotheses. Either the opaque box contains 50 or minus 50. The agent can thus foresee the eight possible outcomes of the four possible sequences. And here's your picture, Omnarly, if you're still watching. Um, so, yeah. All right, so, like correct, like, correct and wrong stuff. All right, sequence A1, B2 ensures 25. The sequence... A2B1 ensures a negative 15, and an agent who embodies CDT is likely to take the sure law sequence A2B1. That's this one here. The agent knows that the predictor is much more than 75% reliable, whichever the option, whichever option is chosen. So no matter what the agent chooses at the first stage, CDT, like any sane decision theory, recommends B1. The agent bet that the predictor predicted correctly at the second stage, since the agent who embodies CDT knows that she will choose B1 at the second stage, the U value of taking both boxes is negative 15, the sure loss of A2B1, and the new value of taking only the opaque boxes is this formula. Whether U2, U, U of A2 or U of A1, the utility of A2 or the utility of A1 is greater depends on how the agent divides her credence between K50 and K-50. But suppose the agent divides her credence equally as she very well might. The agent will thus take the sure loss sequence A2B1, even though a sure gain sequence was available. But so far as I can tell, there is nothing irrational about taking the sure loss sequence to see why it's helpful to represent the sequential decision as an interpersonal game played between two time slices of the agent. Let C be the credence function of the first slice, and let's suppose that the credence function of the second slice comes from C via conditionalizing on the option chosen at the first stage. Let T be the proposition that the predictor predicted correctly and suppose that formula equals 0.9. Let's also continue to suppose that 
there's a C50 and the chance of C of getting right, getting wrong, 50-50. We can then represent Ahmed's insurance as a two-player game using the utility values as payoffs. In each cell A, X, B, Y of the payoff matrix below, the first coordinate is utility of that thing from the perspective of the first slice, that is this formula, and the second coordinate is from the perspective of the second slice. <coughs> so here you go, you've got like all these I mean, this is basically you do the math, and this is what you're gonna like win and lose based on the different options. As the payoff matrix makes clear, the game takes the form of a prisoner's dilemma. Both slices want to maximize the utility value of the joint strategy played. The first slice maximizes the utility value of the joint strategy played by both taking by taking both boxes, no matter what the second slice does. The second slice maximizes the utility value of the joint strategy played by betting that the predictor predicted correctly, no matter what the first slice does. The two choices together lead to diachronic exploitation, but it seems to me, as it will seem to many proponents of CDT, that both choices are rational. It's worth noting that the game theoretic perspective that helps proponents of CDT respond to the threat pro proposed by Ahmed's insurance does not help proponents of CDT respond to the threat posed by two rooms. Suppose that the agent facing two rooms thinks that A and B are equally likely to contain $100. The, then if we use the utility values of sequences of the payoffs, we get the following tri trivial payoff matrix. So you, room one is always 35, and room two is 50, 50, and then 40, because you're breaking up 100 bucks in the boxes. This payoff matrix does not explain why an agent who embodies CDT strictly prefers room 1 to room 2. In fact, it only makes the preference more puzzling, for both slices agree that the utility value of every joint strategy available in room 2 exceeds the utility value of every joint strategy available in room 1. Yes, but you're not talking about the frustrator who knows things that are not represented in this matrix. But, again, if you set it up this way, it looks good this way. Conclusion. I have argued that the preferences of rational agents satisfy the guaranteed principle that the preferences of agents who embody CDT do not, and hence that CDT is false. In doing so, I have argued that a particular alleged counterexample to CDT, namely the frustrator, really is a counterexample. Okay, so... I mean, this is... This paper is in this area. I'm sure this is like all correct stuff. These things just trust rate me. I mean, these are. I ran into Brandon Fidelson once. He seemed like a good guy. Um. Yeah. Um. But yeah, what do I have to say about this? Yeah, I just feel like these things always sort of choose, pick and choose what information they want to represent in the matrix, the matrices, and in the causal decision things. Um. In, and in the sequences, the causal decision sequences, where this really, this is where the paper shined, was where it did show you how, when going through the steps of things, that's where you can see how it looks like it's going to go right, right or wrong, as you're going, excuse me, as you're going through the steps. So if you're going to go through the steps, and it looks like, well, okay, and what, let me get back down this nice little graph down here, we've got pictures finally, and I like pictures in my philosophy too. But it's like, look, if you break stuff up, you got, if you go into that room with the frustrator, it looks like the boxes are going to have 50 bucks or 40 bucks. Whatever you choose, you're going to get 50 bucks or 40 bucks. In room one, you're just going to get 35. So it seems like, look, if you're looking at it this way, it looks trivial. You always go to room two. But of course, this there's no frustrator in this picture right here. Where's the frustrator? I want to know where the frustrator is. Where did the frustrator go? For... Uh, it's a J, not, oh, just pretend that's an F. Frustrate Tor. Yeah, pretend this was like, and there, it's an F now. Um, looks even worse. Alright, terrible handwriting, I'm sorry. Where's my frustrator in this picture? I don't know. Um... That was just terrible. I'm going to erase this. There we go. 
Um, but yeah, so that's why I have a problem with these things. It always seems like people, they're shoot, pick, you get to pick and choose how you want to set up your problem. And then it's like, well, you guys set it up this way and therefore you're wrong. And then I'm sure the causal decision theorist would say something in response. Now the question is, how accurately did this author get the causal decision theory people, um, um, their assumptions how how accurate was how are accurate are they was this author to the cdt theory i don't know would all the cdt theory people agree to this perhaps would they be like me and just have other intuitions maybe i actually i wouldn't say like not like me but would they have other intuitions maybe um i mean even it's like rules of averaging like there's always these little things that um why are you like breaking things up this way even though it seems reasonable to do i don't always buy like why is that the reasonable thing to do like and how does everything come down to like money amounts um yeah see does not hold of imperfect agents nor people who expect to be imperfect this sort of uh, this sort of worries me this is the whole thing is that you've got the people who are perfect predictors of the future but no imperfect agents even though you're talking about perfect agents i this that sort of thing kills me okay even so this is a nice paper again and i assume that they got the author got the sort of CDT perspective right. And in that case, this might be a very nice little argument against causal decision theory. Um, I'm not entirely sure what the alternative is here. Um, but yeah, this is just sort of a negative paper that just argues that CDT is not um, good. But that's about it. If anyone out there has questions, I will probably be done. But this was a quick little paper I could do right now. And so I appreciate everyone out there listening. Uh, I hope everyone has a good night and stays safe. And that'll be it for now. Have a good night, all.